My brief was to write a 3,000 word paper on um, the liberal international order, maritime power and American prosperity. Well, uh, when I thought about it, this looked uh, rather complicated and perhaps overly ambitious. So I decided to uh, whittle it down a bit. And the title I eventually came up with is What a Navy is For? You know, a simple and straightforward question, I thought, and quick and easy to write. Well, as they say, the simplest things are sometimes the most complicated, and so it proved to be with this paper. Um, if, um, or perhaps I should say when uh, you read my paper, you are going to find that my argument is rather tightly compacted. Um, so that uh, in a sense, if you magically were to add a few drops of water to it, the volume of the thing will expand fivefold. And uh, sorry about that, not what I can do about it. Um, I don't propose to walk through every, uh, or even give you a brief summary. Um, I reckon it'll take you about 15, 16 minutes to read it. Um, so you can read it in your own time. But um, in any case, my paper um, opens with a brief discussion of the ideas of Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan. Now, if we were all in the same room, I'm sure that right now I start to see eyes beginning to roll. And so let me quickly say two things. Uh, first of all, this is the American Sea Power Project. And the fact is, is that Mahan was indisputably the father of the concept of sea power. He coined the phrase. And so when discussing sea power, like it or not, all roads do lead back to Mahan. And what sea power was, or what he was, the question he was trying to address in coming up with this sea power is, in fact, what is a Navy for? He is the Mahan, is the very first person in the world to actually provide a coherent explanation of what navies are for, what navies do. The second point I would like to make is that when discussing my paper, or what I discuss in my paper, um, or perhaps I should say outline, is Mahan's later work, not his original work, but his later work, um, basically the stuff that nobody ever reads. Um, and this is the material, all the ideas that he developed from the late 1890s or mid, mid, mid 1890s through to the early 1900s, uh, um, while studying what you might call the strategic implications of globalization. Um, the, for those of you who are not familiar, the first period of globalization ran from around about 1870 to about 1914, 1915. And uh, today we, we say we're in the second era of globalization, which begins from you know, the early to mid 1980s to the present day. Um, so to present the case simply, um, or put it a different way, is there is a sea power theory version 1.0, which you will find in his first book, Influence Sea Power Upon History. But there's also Mahan's sea power version 2.0, which you don't hear about. And um, if you, in fact, look closely, and they are related, because if you look closely in his original influence book, you're going to see strands or elements of this 2.0 theory, but it doesn't really become fully developed and fully visible until you start looking at his writings beginning around about oh, 1902 or so. Um, in any case, so even in influence, uh, so version 1.0 or 2.0, whichever you want to call it, Mahan argued that since the dawn of what you might call modern history, which for him began, of course, in about 1660, international trade had been the single most important factor uh, in wealth generation. In a sense, the global trading system is a wealth generation machine. Uh, it is the goose that lays the golden eggs. Um, in some periods, those eggs are sometimes smaller, and some other periods in history, they're sometimes larger. But in the long and the short of it is, is there's nothing really comparable as a wealth generation machine. And so for Mahan, therefore, the raison d'etre of the Navy, um, its, uh, its timeless mission, if you prefer, is the regulation of access to the global trading system. Uh, what I'm saying here is, is the predominant Navy has the power to safeguard and or to deny access to the single most important font of wealth generation in the world. And that's no small thing. Uh, when reading my paper, I ask you to read it alongside two older pieces from proceedings. 
uh, the, way, the links to which have been provided on the American Sea Power website. The first is by Samuel Huntington and appeared in the May 1954 issue. The second is by Admiral Thomas Hayward and dates from 1979 when he was Chief of Naval Operations. Now, both of these articles are very well known to um, older officers. Uh, more to the point, they're widely acknowledged to be classics and quite rightly so. Um, now, if you do read these three papers together, you're going to notice a number of similarities and a number of very important differences, um, and you'll spot them easily enough. Uh, to my mind, it is the differences rather than the similarities which are going to be the most useful and the most interesting. Or perhaps I should say, uh, it's the reasons for the differences that are the most interesting. Um, and before I actually spell out what they are, you know, I just want you to consider the fact, you know, the span of years we're talking about here. So there's 25 years between Huntington's 1954 article and Admiral Hayward's 1979 article. And there's 42 years between Admiral Hayward's article and mine. And just consider, or the question I'd like you to consider is just how much has the world changed in these 67 years? And arguably, how much has it, how many times has it changed? Um, I would suggest that the main reason for these differences in perspectives uh, is best explained by the differences in the position and the importance and the relationship of the US economy to the global trading system. Um, and just to be clear, I'm not talking here about changes in absolute or relative strength of the US compared to her rivals, uh, though that changes there have been and considerable they are. Um, no, what I'm actually talking about is changes in the structure of the national or, and particularly the world e economic system. So today the international trading system is characterized again by what we call globalization. As I mentioned, we're in globalization too. And it is a very different world from than it had been back in 1954 or even 1979. And in fact, you could probably uh, you, you could probably see that the, the economic world as it exists today that we live in far more closely resembles the world 1902 when Mahan was alive than it did in the intervening period. And so um, very basically what I'm suggesting is, is the structure of the international economic system and the position of the United States economy within it substantially defines the environment in which the United States Navy must operate. Or put another way, the structure of the world economic system substantially determines how and where naval force must be applied to achieve decisive results. Now, these in fact are the implications of Mahan's Sea Power 2.0 arguments. And that is essentially the, uh, my central argument in my paper. Now, as we all know, the building and maintaining of a world-class Navy is a very, very expensive uh, proposition indeed. Um, they require, always require very large numbers of very talented people, and it consumes vast quantities of money. And there are always going to be those who argue that all this talent and money could be spent better elsewhere, you know, rebuilding our roads, reforming our education system or healthcare systems. And uh, God knows we need all those things to be done for sure. Um, it would be interesting to calculate how many miles of highway could be rebuilt for the cost of maintaining, I don't know, say the sixth fleet. Um, you know, if you consider it in such terms, I'm pretty sure that number is going to be a frightening, highly high number. And you know, I'm sure many people would argue it's an indefensibly high number. But to those people, I would say, this is really the wrong way to look at the whole subject. Um, I would like to see us look at this from a much more old fashioned perspective. Now, to look at spending on the Navy as what I call a premium of his insurance upon the long-term prosperity of the United States. You know, put, it, put in these terms, the amount required is actually not a very big number at all, you know, maybe one percentage point. To a lesser or greater degree, I think we all instinctively know this. Uh, we understand the importance of the sea. We understand the importance of the Navy. The problem is, is that most Americans do not. And most American taxpayers do not. And in my opinion, uh, the US Navy has done a very bad job at explaining all this to the American people, uh, what it does for them. Um, it might think it does a good job, but the reality is it does not. Part of the problem is, in my opinion, 
is, is that today's 21st century Navy is not really so clear in its own mind as to what it is supposed to do either. And so I'm going to close with a very simple question. Um, if the Navy cannot articulate to itself the meaning and importance of sea power, let alone explain it to anybody else, then really what chance is there of obtaining the money it needs to build the ships and capabilities that it needs to do its job 